Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. I will get started in just a minute, just giving some people some time to log in here. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks everyone again for tuning in today. My name is Maggie Downing. I'm the manager of digital imaging at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts in Philadelphia. Um, today we'll be presenting the third and final episode of Digitization 201, which builds on the Digitization 101 series I presented over the summer and which uh, recordings of those are all now available on the CCAHA YouTube page. And I will be putting a link to that in the chat box in a minute. Um, the episodes in this series are intended to be short and focused webinars on one topic related to digitization project planning. Um, for Digitization 201, I've recruited other amazing expertise at the Conservation Center to help present these sessions. This series is presented with support from grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the William Penn Foundation. The webinar is being recorded um, and a link will be made available in the next day or two on the CCAHA YouTube page. And a link will also be emailed to all of the participants. I'll be um, keeping an eye on the chat box for questions as we um, go through the presentation. Um, and we'll try to address all of the questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so today's webinar is focused on setting up a digitization studio using a digital camera. And I picked a neutral gray background for these slides, um, which is on theme as you'll we'll discuss later on. And today I'm here with CCAHA's photographer, Andy Pinkham, who has been at the center um, since 2012. Oh. Um, as, as photographer, Andy actually serves several teams at the center. Um, he creates all of the conservation photographic documentation. So he photographs um, objects before, during, and after they receive their conservation treatment. He conducts digitization projects and facsimile printing. And he also supports the marketing department through photography and video production. Um, but today, of course, we are here to talk about digitization. Um, and during his eight years at the center, um, Andy has been instrumental in setting up our two digitization studios and in selecting and installing the equipment that we use. So today we'll discuss the main components of a digitization studio that uses a digital camera for the image capture. And then we'll talk about how to put that all together. So in each of these sections, I'll start with some general recommendations and best practices. And then Andy will give some insight into the specific decisions that we made for um, our studios at the center. Um, but I do just wanna say up front that the decisions and selections that we made are not the only good options for a studio setup, but we're mentioning it here because we feel that it's helpful to provide some specific examples of how it's all come together um, for us. So just keep that in mind um, that your needs may be different. Um, so with that, we will jump right in and talk first things first um, about the studio environment that you wanna think about for your digitization studio. Um, so you want to set up a digitization studio at your own facilities, which is which is great. Um, but first, you need to find a good space that you can dedicate it to. Um, and this can be an office or even a large closet, really. Um, but what you need is uh, the ability to block out light. Um, so you want to be able to black out any windows, to be able to turn off the overhead lights and just essentially make the room dark. You also wanna um, have the ability to paint it a neutral color. 
so that the reflection of the lighting does not tint um, your images or throw off your color balance. Um, and you need enough space in this um, studio for the height of the column that you'll be mounting your camera to, the table or the baseboard, um, the light stands, uh, a computer station, as well as the landing space for the objects and space for um, your technician and maybe another technician um, to, to lend a hand. Um, so here uh, you're thinking about just not, not just the footprint of the equipment that you'll be putting in the studio, but also of the people and objects that you'll have in there as well. You wanna make sure that your space has enough outlets for all of the equipment and an ethernet cable hookup if, if you wanna be wired to the internet. So at CCAHA, we have two imaging studios, um, one where we do most books and smaller objects and it's a smaller space and one that's larger and more versatile. And that's what I have shown here. Um, and this image is our larger imaging studio. Um, so with that, I just wanted to uh, kick it off to Andy. And um, Andy, can you talk a little bit about the two studio environments at this space and, and what those rooms are like? Yeah, basically the, the one that we use for our before, during and after treatment photography is the larger of the, of the two studios that we have. That one is 12 by 15 feet and the copy stand table is the surface for that um, is 45 by 65 inches wide. And that handles pretty much most of, of what we do. Say if we have larger things um, like maps, we've, we've had a, a couple of maps and really large family trees that have come through and we're able to image those out in our larger work area. Um, and we don't have the same amount of light control for that, but it's, it's certainly um, a good environment for just really even light if we have to do that. But I try to do as much uh, before and after treatment photography in our initial studio, just for the fact that we have control with our studio uh, strobes that we use and I'll and I'll move on to the lighting and all of that in a bit. The small studio, the size of that is approximately six and a half by 11 feet and the copy stand table there is 26 inches by 56 inches and we use that mostly for books and smaller objects. We have um, a piece of equipment, a book easel in there, which pretty much stays in the position, the same position all the time. We can get into that uh, a little bit more of, of about what that's about. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, and the equipment in both studios are highly interchangeable. And that's one of the things that I like about them uh, using those a lot that we don't have to it's basically a component system in both studios. So we can we can interchange any piece of equipment that we need to at any time. Can you talk about the gray color that was selected for these studios? Right, and it's basically what we came up with because uh, gray, um, a 50% neutral gray, and uh, we can put this in the notes later on. I can tell you exactly uh, what kind of paint that we got and and to give you the specs on that. But it was basically to keep the color as neutral as possible so you're not uh, introducing any sort of different uh, color shade or hue into that environment. Great. Thanks, Andy. Um, you mentioned some equipment, so I will move on to that yep. um, part and then we can go into more details there. Yes. Um, so. Okay, um, so this is a glimpse into the, the smaller studio. So this is our larger imaging studio and this is the smaller one. You can see it's a little bit of a tighter space, um, but that works um, very well for, for smaller objects, archival collections and bound, bound documents. Um, so next we'll talk more about the equipment that you need in a setup like this. Um, so I'll go into each of these uh, a little bit more in the following slides. So you need a digital camera, you need some nice lighting, 
Um, you need a copy stand or a, a column and a table combination. Um, a book crate, you'll be imaging bound volumes and some accessories like a light meter, a wireless remote and a color chart. So I'll, I'll talk again, talk about each of these more in depth in the next few slides. Um, so up first is the digital camera. Um, and I go into more about specifics of equipment selection in an episode in digitiz Digitization 101, um, the last episode of that series. So I won't go too in depth on that here. Um, but basically you want a camera that offers a high enough resolution to capture the materials that you have in your collection. So the higher the resolution in your camera, the more detail you're able to capture in your objects. And you can determine the resolution by looking at the pixel dimensions in the technical specifications of your camera. Um, when you're considering what camera to buy, you also want to invest in a lens that will not move um, with gravity when it's essentially placed um, facing directly down, um, because that's going to throw off your, your focus. Um, and you really want it to stay steady as you're moving through a large collection of materials. Um, when you're shopping around for a camera, look for companies that provide you with the ability to test and exchange your equipment if needed. Um, and Andy, I have listed the, the two cameras that we use at the Conservation Center. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, the um, the phase one camera, basically it's um, it's a digital SLR camera and it also has um, different from say like a Nikon or a Fuji or a Canon camera, it has three components, which we see here on our slide. You'll see a lens pointing down and then it, it's, it might be a little bit hard to distinguish here, but then there's a body and then there's a digital back, which will uh, basically it's, it goes on to the back of the camera there and it's and it's interchangeable with say like newer backs that come out higher resolution. So the thought here is to basically um, you get you get once you buy into the system, you upgrade your backs as as time goes on. Um, you know, and there's there's certainly wear and tear on on the other components as time goes on. But the thought here is to basically have these digital um, magazines or, or backs interchangeable as you uh, as you go along. So um, the thing that that made a real difference for us, we had a 31 megapixel medium format camera before and basically the, the resolution that it was giving us was was not high enough for what we would need on a continual basis. So we found ourselves having to do a couple of different things. We we found ourselves um, stitching a lot, which is okay, but it's it can be uh, very labor intensive depending upon what sort of materials that you're working with. Um, and then another option that we could have used uh, and do use from time to time is that we've got a local service bureau here who has uh, what is called a crew scanner and the approximate um, imaging size, imaging area, the scanning bed is close to 48 by 72 inches at 300 uh, PPI. But it's something with that we, we have to, with the materials, we have to pack them up. They have to be sent across town. We need a conservator on site to be able to do um, you know, to make sure that everything's okay with the traveling and with the imaging part. So there's a lot more involved if something has to go out of out of house with the logistics and so forth. So um, not only did this resolution really help uh, in terms of the quality and not having to stitch as much uh, together, I, I realize I'm I'm going down kind of a, a rabbit hole here, but, uh, <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll, I'll wrap this part up quickly. But basically with, with being able to uh, image larger objects in house, it really helped us in terms mm -hmm. of uh, keeping things here and not having to send them across town. The camera listed below is a Nikon D850 camera and its resolution. Oh, let me skip back up to the phase one camera real quick with you guys. 
uh, basically, um, we use the 400 PPI setting as sort of a benchmark, a place to, to start with, with resolution. And the phase one camera, this is approximate now, can um, render an image of 29 in inches by 39 inches at 400 PPI. And the Nikon D850, um, this one is the one that we use for our day-to-day before and after and during treatment photography. It's, it's basically our, our all around go-to camera for the treatment photos. And we do a fair amount of facsimile work on it as well. And the measurements here are 13 and three quarters by 20 and a half inches approximately. And both of these do a super job for um, our facsimile or high resolution images, as long as they stay within those dimensions at uh, that resolution of 400 and PPI. The lenses, um, what we use on both of the cameras, we have uh, on the, and they're different here, the, um, on the phase one camera, we have a normal focal length le uh, lens, which is 80 millimeters, 2.8 lens straight, um, and that does that handles most of, of what we can do quite easily. Um, conversely, what we have on the Nikon is a 24 to 70 millimeter 2.8 zoom. And when you're looking at lenses, try to get the fastest uh, lens that you can, the ones that have uh, at 2.8 or better. And that's really going to help in terms of quality and being able to um, see the, the most am amount of detail. Um, it's really handy to have a zoom lens for that type of thing based on um, how much the size of the objects coming in for treatment. There's really a lot of variation in size. So this is the lens that we have on the camera about 99% of the time. And another one that I need to um, mention as well is that we have a 105 millimeter macro lens for our much smaller pieces as well. Yeah, um, and that we can actually photograph um, some negatives at, mm -hmm. at a high resolution with the with the macro lens on the Nikon. So that's that's a plus as well. Yep. Um, the, the the main thing we were trying to get across. Not maybe not the main thing, but one main thing is that you don't necessarily need a um, medium format camera um, anymore with the newer models of 35 millimeter cameras, you can capture um, high resolution if you're photographing smaller, smaller objects. So if you have a lot of archival materials, you may be able to get by pretty well with um, the Nikon or, or, or a similar um, 35 millimeter newer model. Um, but I want to move on to lighting. Um, and so the lighting is very important in setting up your studio. And the lighting can be continuous or strobe. Um, but the main thing is that it should be even and consistent in its color temperature. Um, and that's critical in a digitization project because you don't want to have to be adjusting the exposure and the white balance in every image or so. Um, if you decide to go with strobes, you'll want to equip them with soft boxes or umbrellas um, to soften and even out the lighting that falls on the object. Um, and you want to invest in some professional grade photography lighting. Um, the lighting is just about as important as the camera quality in creating good images. So it's imp important to invest well here. Um, so Andy will talk a little bit about the lighting that we use at the Conservation Center. We use um, Profoto D2 monolights. These are strobe lighting. Um, and talk a little bit about why we selected these for our, sure. our purpose. Yeah, um, it's, it's something that we, um, as the photo department, we also consult very heavily with our book and paper department in terms of, of what they're needs are. So there, there are two main kinds of, of lighting um, out there to, to choose from. And LED lighting, as well as strobe lighting, can be very attractive for a couple of different reasons. LED lighting is 
just keeps on getting better and better as, as time goes on. Um, and the quality just keeps on getting better and, and the ability to control um, temperature, uh, you know, in terms of the color cast and all of that is, it just keeps on growing by leaps and bounds. Um, and conversely, we use strobe and the reason is, is because um, unlike LED, LED is a continuous light source and so you've got a couple of things coming into play. We have quite a large environment. It's very bright here and there are lots of different light sources that we have all the way from the fluorescent lights to like win window light, even like to uh, the small bit of light that, that can come through the studio door if it's open. So um, that was a huge consideration with strobe because you, you basically, you have the intensity of the strobe light, but then also the ability to use um, that the the quickness of that flash burst to be able to, uh, if we're say if we're out in the lab photographing, uh, it can it can overpower those other light sources very easily, and we're able to have a lot more control with LED lights. If you are if you have other competing light sources you need to be able to um, have complete control over the environment to be able to turn those off, or mm -hmm. if it's window light to be able to um, basically block out that light. And so with the strobe, you have a burst of light, really quick one rather than a continuous light source. So that was a really big deal for us technically. Um, and then in considering the kind of materials that we have, um, in, in some cases, it's, it's not very often, but some, some things can be sensitive to light. So um, intense light on them continuously may not be good. So that's another consideration uh, as well. So uh, as much as I like LED, I think our, for our environment, the right choice was at this, at this point in time was to, to go with strobe lighting. Great, thank you. Yep. Um, the and next. Let me back up for just a second, Maggie. There, yeah. there. Um, we use pro photo equipment, but there are also other ones out there which which can do um, just as just as good a, a job. These are these are incredibly expensive. Um, <laughs> the <laughs> um, their customer services is, is excellent. The build quality is really great, but. Um, please look at your other options to see um, if there might be something that that can fill it the bill just as well for you. Okay, um, so I'll just move on to the next critical component, which is your copy stand. Um, and by this, I mean a combination of a column that your camera is mounted to and a table. Um, so a copy stand kind of by its strict de definition means a column that's mounted to a baseboard like what I have shown on the bottom right. Um, but these components do not all have to be attached to put together a successful studio. Um, you can set it up instead um, to include a wall mounted or freestanding column like the other illustrations on this slide um, and a table that sits directly underneath it. Um, or it can be a, a traditional copy stand, again, where, in which the column is attached to the baseboard. Um, but things to consider when you're um, looking at this piece of equipment is that the column um, should be tall enough to be able to capture, um, to mount your camera at a height where you can capture the size of the materials that you have in your collection. Um, so if you have a larger object, your camera will want to be further away um, in order to capture that all in a single image. Um, the column should be sturdy and not shift at all once you've secured it in place. This is um, super important um, for your camera. You don't want that falling, falling down or, or sliding out of focus. Um, and also for the materials that you'll be digitizing. So you really want something that's going to be very secure. Um, if your camera does slide out of place, even a little bit, um, it will throw off the focus and the resolution um, of, of your image. And if you can afford it, uh, columns that have measurements on the side, um, uh, measurement units are a plus. 
as are columns that have a motorized unit to move it up and down, especially if you have a lot of varied sizes of materials like we encounter at the conservation center. And for the table, I mean, the main thing is really that it should be sturdy and level. <laughs> there's, not, there's not a whole too much to say about that. It can, it can be many forms, um, but it should be um, able to support the materials that you have and, and be consistently level. Um, so we actually have two um, studio copy stand setups at the center. So Andy will describe those two. Yeah, the, the one in the current slide, you'll see the, the three images there of, the, of the, the copy stand and copy columns. The one all the way on the left, the largest photo is, um, is exactly like the one that we have in our before and after treatment uh, photography studio. And generally the, a, a rule of thumb is that the larger your objects that you're going to be imaging pretty much the larger your environment and setup needs to be. So this column goes up fairly high. I want to say, well, it's it goes up to about 48, 49 inches. So that's able to, to cover a lot. We have it secured to the wall. It's, auto, it's also motorized, which is a, a big deal. It sounds like a, a bit of a luxury, but this, um, it's, I would say it's, it's almost a must because from a safety standpoint, you have, um, as we see in the photo there, you've got, it's a large piece of equipment and generally with a large camera attached to it. And you have people and objects working below. And from a sta safety standpoint, this is a geared motorized unit. So as it goes up and down, as it, as you, um, as you're not using the controller, it's very much locked in place. So the last thing that you would want to have happen would uh, have one of these copy columns uh, for any reason, if it wasn't motorized, slip and fall on a person or an object or that kind of thing. So that's a, that's a big consideration. And plus um, it goes up fairly high. So to be able to operate it from where you're standing, I think it's a really, important thing as well. So from a safe safety standpoint, uh, that's a that's a real big deal to us here. So um, but the one on the left here is is mainly used for imaging of the larger objects. And then what we have is that uh, in the smaller um, the uh, annex studio is the column, which is the the studio column unit, which is the top image on the right side there. And we like that one. It's mostly um, used in that small little studio, but it can very easily uh, be moved into other parts of, of the lab or other rooms if we need to do uh, other projects. We had a series of panoramas come through here a while ago, which we used with a suction table in another room. And this worked uh, really well for it. So it's super secure. Um, it's, it's mobile. It's a little, it's a little bit clunky, but for good reason, there's, it's a lot of weight, um, and is, is very well anchored. This one, uh, is not motored, but what it has is a counterweight with it, uh, with a pulley. So that's, that's really good as well. So it will counterbalance the weight of the camera. So that's, that's super helpful, but, uh, we have, where it is right now is in the smaller studio with a, a table in front of it. And it pretty much stays anchored in the same position uh, mm -hmm. for it as long as it is in there. Yeah, and that's that's why we, we kind of went with that version in, in the studio where things stay a lot more static is that we can just set it in one position and then let it let it be. Yes. Um, so those are like the, the main the main three investments is the, the camera, the copy stand and the lighting. Um, but I'll say a few words about a book cradle or a book copying easel, um, which is pretty important if you plan on digitizing a collection of bound materials. Um, this piece of equipment helps to keep each page in the same plane in relation to the camera. So um, your pages don't appear to change in size as you move through a book and the pages get further away from a camera. 
Um, and they also help, the, the glass plate also helps to even out and flatten pages, um, which will help with legibility. Um, this book copying easel that we have here has two panels that move independently from each other. And that way books can, the books that can open easily can be laid all the way open like the image on the top. Um, but here the spine still has um, space in between those two panels to flex as you move through the book and not be crushed. Um, but if you have a more delicate book that doesn't necessarily open all the way and needs to be supported at an angle, um, you can set it up like the, in the image below and supporting it with bump cradles as you move through the book. Um, I want to keep moving, kind of just keeping an eye on time, but Andy, did you want to say anything else about um, the book cradle component? Uh, the book cradle was a real game changer for us. Um, you know, as you had mentioned real, uh, as you had mentioned before, being able to keep those page sizes consistent, there's no other way to do it other than um, moving the camera, which would be an arduous task. So um, we've had really great luck with it. And um, if you were, if you ever have the chance to see one in action, it's you'll understand why they're why they're such a great piece of equipment to have. Yeah, it's really sped up um, and improved the production quality in, in our bound material imaging workflows. Definitely. Um, so those are pretty much the main components, um, but there are some accessories that you want to consider um, to help everything run smoothly. Um, first is a light meter that's shown on the bottom. Um, this will measure the light as it falls on the table and on your objects so you can set the exposure correctly. Another thing is a color chart and we have an example of one on the top image there. Um, this will help you set your white balance and double check your exposure. Uh, and then I also threw in extra batteries <laughs> because you always want to get extra batteries. Yes. Nothing is more aggravating than getting into <laughs> the flow and then having to stop and wait and charge your battery. So always pay the extra few dollars and get <laughs> the batteries in the charger. Um, other things to think about, you'll need sync cords um, or a remote flash unit if you'll be using strobes and you um, so that the, the camera will trigger the strobes when you um, take a picture. Um, but um, Andy, do you want to talk about the color chart and flash meter that we use? Yeah, sure. Um, the the X-ray color chart, uh, we like this one a lot. This is the one that we use. Uh, for our for our before and after treatment photography, and it's great because it basically it's it folds up like a like a wallet, uh, and it it protects itself, and um, that's the thing that's uh, it it makes it more durable. But um, you get basically the color chart, and then you go onto their site and you can download the uh, calibration software. And basically what we do at the beginning of the day is put this down on the copy stand. Uh, we take, uh, we turn on our strobes. We take an image of it to check the lighting levels to make sure that they're okay. And if the lighting levels are okay, you then run that image through the software and it will give you uh, an imaging. It'll give you a profile that works with uh, Lightroom and I'm not quite sure if it you if it works with the Capture One software or not, Maggie. That's that's a question for another day, maybe. I know that we've tried experimenting with it before, but basically using this with Lightroom, it it it's super easy. It takes about five minutes to do if your lighting levels are correct, and and it will make sure that you have um, consistent color um, from day to day. The uh, light meter that we use is a Sayconic light meter. It's an incident and uh, incident flash meter. Um, and when we're setting up new lighting or if we're moving lights around at all, it ba basically gives us instant feedback as to what those light levels are. And we'll go and check the light levels more closely um, in the software and so forth to make sure that all of the four corners of our capture area are um, are equal in terms of the amount of lighting that hits uh, all of those four corners and in the middle. But this is, uh, it can definitely save you a lot of uh, time and aggravation getting those light levels right um, using the meter. Great. Um... 
And I second the extra batteries part. That's that's a big deal. <laughs> uh, OK, so um, when you're planning a digitization workflow, don't forget about your computer and file storage needs. Um, you want to be better, be better than Hansel and Zoolander. Um, make sure <laughs> you know what you need before you're diving in. This is a, an important component um, to, to think about in your budgeting. Um, so you want to invest in a computer. So your camera will be tethered to your computer, and that's where you'll you'll be processing your raw files and processing your final files as well. Um, so those programs require a lot of uh, RAM or memory. So make sure that you invest in a computer um, that has enough of that to help all of these programs run smoothly. And a solid state hard drive, um, which is gonna be faster at writing and processing image files. Um, these are just broad recommendations, uh, but we recommend researching the software that you're gonna use um, to make sure that the computer has all of the correct requirements. Um, and we have a review site here. I'm going to put a link for this in the chat. Um, Digital Trends, it's good for um, uh, tech reviews. Uh, it's not certainly not the only one, but I just wanted to, to drop that one in there too. Um, if you work at an institution and you have an IT uh, company or a consultant, definitely check in with them about um, the equipment that you're thinking of getting and, and what you need it to do. And they, that's gonna save you a lot of time right there because that is um, their job. <laughs> um, you'll also need to invest in image editing software of, um, for your raw files and your final files. Um, raw file processing, um, that software may come with your camera or it may be available for purchase uh, with your camera. It's usually a proprietary program that's uh, dedicated to a certain camera type. Um, and uh, for your final processing, uh, final file work like um, uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, if you're working with Photoshop or Lightroom, um, many of these software programs are now offered as monthly subscriptions, so the barrier to entry isn't as high as like a one-time purchase cost. Um, and if you're a nonprofit, you should check out TechSoup because they often have discounted rates for um, a lot of different types of programming. And I am putting that in the chat. Um, also make sure you have a file storage plan. Um, I'm not gonna say too much on that here because I um, there's another episode of Digitization 101 that is fully dedicated to file storage. Um, but just keep in mind as you're beginning a digitization uh, program, that high resolution digital files take up a lot of space and you should have a plan for those. Um, and then next we're gonna talk about putting it all together. Andy, did you have anything else you wanna add about um, computer performance? Um, basically, yeah, the, the computers are the, you know, they're the ones, it, it's the, the part of your, the imaging that's the most, I would say, confusing and confounding. Um, because it's like you do your you do your research you you do all the comparisons and that kind of thing, um, but it's all of this information is is constantly being updated. So uh, these review sites like Digital Trends is really great and um, one that I found to to be most helpful because they'll put machines up uh, against each other. And another thing that um, we can certainly offer our audience today is if, it, if they wanna get in touch with us with the specs of, of what we currently have and, and use and what our success is like with that, um, that's, that's great as, as well. I just purchased a new Apple machine, which should be coming uh, in the next week or so. But basically my methodology in, in buying this was to, to check all of the max boxes possible <laughs> and to see what the cost ended up being. Um, but uh, so, you know, to, to start out with like the highest price unit and uncheck the boxes, but um, with the things that I absolutely did not need. But anyway, uh, we can certainly give you all the specs on what we use and what our experiences has been with, um, with the uh, computer systems that we're using. Okay. Um, uh, but before we wrap up, I want to talk about kind of how this all 
comes together. Um, so all of these different components, when you're putting it in the studio space for the first time, um, Andy, can you tell us kind of like what you would put in the studio first and how, how you would go about um, setting everything up just for the first time? Yeah, the thing that, that you have to really, um, really consider is with your working space, how big the objects are that, that you're gonna be working with and where, you know, where are those things gonna land? And so that's gonna dictate, um, you know, your room size, and then also where you need to, what needs to support those objects. So the first thing would be your support, like a, how big does the, the copy stand need to be? Um, how, and, and then after that, you have the support for your lights. And if they, their stands aren't just the only way to go, but um, what we do is a number of different things here. So to have the movable, uh, is is an important thing, but you can also get wall mounted units if you're sure that you're not going to have to be moving things around a lot and that can afford you more space. And don't forget also is when you're going to be working with objects, if they're larger, um, are there going to be other people in there working with you? Uh, what sort of room do you need for? We use carts here anytime that um, we're working with objects. So you need room for your cart. You need to be able to move objects around easily in the studio and um, not having things get in the way. So ergonomics is, is a super big deal. So I would say where the object is gonna land, the kind of stand that you're using, um, you know, if it's gonna be wall mounted like the, the column that we had discussed before, but all of those considerations in terms of like how big a footprint uh, that you need and, and then what's going to go in there to support the object, the camera, and then the lights as well. Another thing that we do uh, for before and after treatment photography is books. And um, in this slide here, we image them pretty close to a 45 degree angle, which you'll, you know, that that character at the bottom holding the object is is me, but this would be the vantage point of where a book would be in it. So a tripod has to go there and support the camera while you're imaging. So you may have another person doing book handling in there, um, room for a cart, that sort of thing. So as much extra space as you can afford is is really helpful. The equipment itself may take up not that much space, but people in it and that extra room for being able to work uh, easily with objects, I, I would say is really important. Um, and then when you're, you're putting everything together, you want to uh, make sure that everything is level, that your camera is level, that your um, copy stand table is level. Um, and you want to put the column in first, the column and the table, um, and install your lighting before you put your camera on and start doing your testing. Um, what uh, aperture would you recommend for, for starting out um, was, was strictly for digitization? The one that we've settled on is, is F11, and it tends to be the, the sweet spot for uh, sharpness on the particular lenses that we're using. And it also affords you a, a rather generous uh, amount of depth of field. And what we found is that if you are if you use apertures of like 16 and 22, things just seem to get a, a bit softer. Okay. Um, and with the lighting, you want to um, set that at an even distance on both sides from the camera and then angle that at a 45 degree angle um, so that the lighting is, is also centered with the camera. Um, and then next you would photograph the color chart and um, test your lighting. Um, and then once you get everything kind of set, make sure you write all of these things down. Um, if you ever have to move a component in your studio, um, you'll be able to, to get it at least back to a good starting point for, for your testing. Um, we were going to include some, some thoughts on day-to-day -day workflow, um, but 
with the, the time limits for these episodes, we're gonna save that um, for some upcoming episodes. Um, but for now, I wanted to kind of wrap up here and um, put up our email addresses. I did see a lot of questions coming into the chat box, um, which I will start reading, I think, hopefully from the top one. Um, but essentially, this wraps up our Digitization 201 series. So thanks, everyone who has been watching and sharing. Um, I want to spend some time, again, to address these questions. Um, if you have some ideas that you would like to see um, for in future episodes, go ahead and throw that in the chat box as well. Um, it says continuing to develop, um, and we love the engagement that we're getting. Um, and if you think of a question later, feel free to um, say, send either one of us an email. Um, so Andy, I'm gonna go up and read uh, some of these first questions here. Um, the first one we have um, just somebody, Christopher requesting comments on the Kaiser 5400K lighting that I, sh I showed in uh, the lighting slide. And I will say that we do not use this. <laughs> I just said it um, as a as an example of what a setup using um, a coffee stand with continuous lighting um, is. Uh, <laughs> so I can't really can't really speak too much to that. Unfortunately, I just wanted to have that as an illustration um, for another type of setup. I think you're going to see just a lot more of that as as time goes on, and it's just in in terms of what our knowledge of it is. It's, uh, it's not something that we elected to use, but um, I think the fact that this, um, that the LED systems were continuous and we had the choice of whether we wanted to go with strobe or, or continuous with some of the light sensitive materials that we used, um, that, that we get every once in a while, we thought that um, in the general scope of things that using strobe for our for our overall use would would be better but um i would say definitely do um your research on these led systems because there are so many great things about them they you know they don't emit heat which is really wonderful as well it um you know at the end of the day if you're doing a lot of uh imaging um you don't feel like you've been at a disco for the last <laughs> few hours um so they definitely have their pluses to them and and i find them as um you know a, a, a very uh, viable and um suitable choice depending upon what sort of objects you are using but we do not use them due to once in a while we we get some stuff in that's rather sensitive and then the fact as well of being able to go into um a mixed lighting and environment and not have to control uh, the ambient light uh, as much. Mm -hmm. the, the strobes can really kind of take over and overpower pretty much anything that's out in the main part of our lab area. So we found that to be really uh, attractive as well. Strobes being basically what you have is a flash burst as opposed to uh, a continuous light source like LED. Mm -hmm. Um, the next question, uh, Jen asks, how large can the objects be from the max height of the copy stand? Um, from the max not... height of the copy stand there, it's approximately um, 29 by 39 inches. Um, and we do get larger objects in there that we do image, but we would um, it, say if we can do something in, say, one or two stitches, that's so uh, we would we would do that and really what dictates um the things that we are able to stitch are things that have uh, a lot of contrast say like a map with really great definition to it uh where the lines are going to be where the contrast is going to be really easy for your stitching software to to be able to uh, pick up on because that's what it that's what it registers it it tries to find uh the contrast and the content and and when putting those images uh together uh another thing is that that we found is is super important as well is that if you are in um and if you're in a situation where you do need to um 
combine images, the ability for them to lay flat is super important as well, because if they aren't, um, that can really sort of fool the software that you're using. It's what would have been further away in one image uh, can be closer and, you know, it, it just register not as easily. So the flatter the, an object can lie, if you are going to be stitching images uh, together, the, the better. And I'll just add to that, um, to Jen's question, that's, that's, those are the dimensions for the setup that we have. Um, but it depends on the, the size of the column that, that you will have in your studio, um, kind of the, the dimensions of the object below it. And then also the resolution of, of the camera as well. Right. Um, next question is from Jeffrey. Is there ever a need to add a larger boom arm to the mono stand to increase the depth from the column for larger objects? With a studio, with a studio column, um, that arm is is can go out fairly far. I don't have a measurement on what that is. That's a really great question because with the um, with the uh, studio column in our treatment photography studio, sometimes we're we're limited by how far out that that will come. We have it pretty much maxed out, but with a studio column, that's uh, that's something that we could we could give you the specs on that, and um, that'll swing out fairly far. Great. Um, and then I have a question from Mary, which I can take. Um, are there? Can you provide details on the particular book cradle that we use? Um, and we use what's called a Linhoff, and I'll type that the name of that right into called a Linhoff book copying easel. Um, but there are there are plenty others on the market. Um, and let's see, I lost my spot in the question. Okay, here we are. Um, the next question is uh, from Dominique. How often do you recalibrate the equipment, um, the, the camera, the lights, et cetera? Um, and that would be at the beginning of every imaging, imaging session. So it could be, usually it's every day. Um, whenever we switch the lighting for any reason, um, we and we would recalibrate, remeasure that. It's a, it tends to be a pretty quick process, and it goes a long way um, in in your image quality. Um, Marion asks, "What are you using batteries for?" My camera has a power source connected to the computer. Um, that's great. The um, I think of that ours has that capacity too, right, Andy? Yes, we can do it. Um, we, if you were to ever come by the studio, we we live in a land of it's. They're just wires everywhere. So um, we do, especially in the larger studio, that that camera moves around a lot. So to the the less wires I can deal with, the better. So I elected to go. Um, with with batteries for for this one, um, and that's that's really a consideration. There's you have to do what what fits fits what you're doing the best. And if it's always up on the copy stand, then certainly uh, having it wired to it is is a, a viable um, and certainly a, a good alternative there. Um, but if you're going to be using the camera off the stand, I use it out in the lab a good deal. Uh, sometimes we even shoot video with it because we've been getting more into video. So we definitely have the more batteries and cards that we have, the the better because they 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 like to uh, mm -hmm. they like to go out. But um, <laughs> but anyway, and they're also um, I know specifically for the Nikon cameras, there are also options to get uh, a higher capacity battery, which can give you. Uh, 7,000 shots per, per charge. But um, if having it tethered, if it's up on the copy stand all the time, then certainly having it, having it powered by, um, you know, the wall or the computer is, is certainly viable. Um, next question is from Christopher, uh, requesting comments on the value of monitors designed for digital image work and the software to test the integrity of the display versus the color table. 
Um, I'll say just a few things here and then and, uh, pitch it to Andy. Um, we, the color charts will come with assigned values. So numerical values as they should appear in the software program. Um, so we really are, are testing that um, to making sure that those are correct more than using a visual display. Um, but that said, we do calibrate our monitors regularly. So there's not a huge discrepancy there, which can be pretty um, distracting as, as a technician. Um, but when we're looking at color, we're really making sure that the, the, the color is reading correctly in the software first and foremost. Um, Andy, did you wanna talk more, any more about uh, color calibration for monitors? Yeah, and it's, it's definitely an important thing to us here, but I think that the decision that you have to make for yourself and if you're working with a group or an institution, whatever your environment is, um, you have to set up, there, there are a lot of guidelines by what, um, and this you could do, this is certainly not our area of expertise and, and one that um, I'm sure that there are webinars out, out there for this, but what we did with our calibration and the, and also the way that we have set things up is, is what serves our environment. And by that, I mean like what the technicians need to see uh, in the images that we produce for paper treatment. And then also um, on the facsimile end of things, when we're doing the high end, um, the high resolution imaging, you know, how do we arrive at that? And so basically there, there are guidelines that we go by in terms of hitting target points and so forth um, using um, their Library of Congress is a great place to go to, to get that information. So we'll use that initially as a jump off point, but then um, it also, you have to, um, once you do all of that, um, that initial work, um, if you look at something on, on the screen and it's not rendering it the way that you need to render it, then you need to do more work in, on an individual level to, to get it to where you need it. Uh, it's sort of like a, a GPS. All of this is kind of like the software, the monitors are kind of like, you have to think of it as like software, like GPS. It, it can do a really great job to get you to your destination, but it's not always going to be 100% correct. If you worked off of GPS alone, it may have you driving uh, through a bush if you're not careful. So doing all of that work in terms of um, setting up your monitor correctly and then also finding out what a good monitor, um, you know, what is, what is a good price to pay for a good monitor? The sky is the limit in terms of what you want to spend. But um, I think that there are some there are some really great monitors out there at a decent price. And then there are some really bad monitors out there at an expensive price. So that's something that um, like one of these tech websites is going to be uh, really helpful with. But it's you could go on uh, for hours about calibration and, and how you choose a monitor in the software. I hope I'm I hope I'm answering that question to to some degree, but it's that's that's a really broad subject. Um, yeah, and we we are just coming up on an hour, so um, I guess we can continue to work through these questions. But I just wanted to let folks know um, this will this will be recorded and made available online, um, and also feel free to get in touch with us via email. Um, Andy, you want to keep going through some of these questions? Uh, sure. Let me uh, scroll down here. OK. Um, we have one um, from Doris. She asks, um, are there any professional shops where you can have someone else do the photography? Um, great question. <laughs> yes. Um, we are one of them. Um, we, CCAHA does a lot of um, dig contract digitization work um, for clients that come and either may just be coming primarily to the center to have um, 
an object treated co for conservation, and then they want a digitized version of it as well. Um, but we also work with, a lot with libraries, museums, and archives that want to digitize larger collections of, of their work. And we are um, a vendor that can do that. Um, I also have uh, presented an episode in the Digitization 101 series on um, things to think about when you are thinking about doing your project in-house versus outsourcing it um, and what to look for in a vendor. So I will put a link to that one in the chat as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that's definitely a, a good option um, in, a, in a lot of, for a lot of different projects. Um, Carolyn uh, writes about a suggestion for a digital experience of paging through a book. Um, and Carolyn, I think I will um, re reach out to you individually via email, um, see if we can um, kind of do some research on that. I don't have a suggestion off the top of my head. Um, Marianne writes, uh, we have images that are folded and are impossible to unfold completely without damaging. Any suggestions on how best to digitize? Um, coming from a conservation center, we would recommend, certainly recommend having these looked at by a conservator. Um, it's certainly possible that a simple treatment um, could be applied um, to make them safe to unfold and be able to handle for digitization. Um, if you are seeking conservation um, information, uh, just be sure to tell them that that's what your goal is, that your goal is just to stabilize it for digitization um, and that it won't continue to be handled if that's, if that's um, how you wanna proceed. Um, but we wouldn't really recommend um, damaging something to image it um, for the most part. Um, Nicole asks, uh, do you use any sort of cloth underneath objects for the background? And if so, what kind of cloth? Um, usually we use a, a mat board or a um, smooth for mica surface to do our imaging on. Um, and that depends on the client's needs. So we we'll usually will shoot on a black or white background, depending on um, the type of material and what the client has requested. Um, we usually don't use cloth, um, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, except for um, daguerreotypes and, and cased images, is that correct? Well, there, yeah, there, you, you touched on a couple of the, two of the things that we do. We also have a black um, I want to say velveteen background that we use, and that'll give us an absolute black, and it's very soft. Um, and we'll use that for when we shoot like tin types, daguerreotypes, things like that. It's it basically will absorb light, and it's going to give you the closest thing to to absolute black. Um, we shoot things mostly on either a gray or white map board, but they are clean, clean, clean. That's that's the name of the game there. Um, for the books, we really love using a neutral gray formica surface because uh, any of you book folks out there know of the evils of red rot. And red rot is lighter than air, gets into just about everything. And if you try to put it on any sort of porous surface, you can't get it out. So. Um, we love using the Formica for it because you basically, after you're done with that, it can be nasty um, and really dirty. You just clean it off and you're, you're back in action in a, in a few minutes with it. It's the thing that you have to be careful with We is that if you're photographing directly into it, it's going to have a sheen to it. So with books, um, pretty much all the time we're photographing it at a 45 degree angle. So you're not gonna pick up on any, any sort of flare there. Super. Um, there, I am seeing a few more technical questions come in um, from Marion and from- I can answer the lens question. Oh, great. Um, so the question is what lens type won't have any curvature distortion? They all have it. <laughs> <laughs> they all have it to, to some degree. And um, the ones that, that have it the least, and you also have to think um, now in the digital, um, in the digital um, 
environment, basically you have software that is, that's very well acclimated with it. Um, let me give you an example one uh, for, for the phase one cameras, you've got capture one with it. So it knows what lens it's working with. So you have the ability to um, control that distortion and minimize that. The lens that off of the top of my head that I know has the least amount of distortion right out of the gate, um, no, you know, before you introduce any software to it, is I believe it is the the hundred and 20 millimeter macro lens uh that they that they have and that is that's probably that's basically used for like photographing um flat objects um and then the last more technical question from amelia can you recommend any resources for lighting tricky items such as an etched copper plate um and if you have any thoughts off the top of your head, if not, we can follow up via email. I think, you know, something in, in also if you could send us like uh, like one one thing that we do is is that we photograph um, daguerreotypes here, which basically mirror anything that you put in front of them. So they can be really difficult to do. It depends upon how large the the object is. And we can certainly, um, if she's willing to send us just a quick snapshot of what she has and um, what the size of that is, we could offer some tips on it. But we have um, we have something that we use very specifically um, that will take care of getting rid of any sort of um, reflection from the camera or lights. Um, and it's quite an interesting contraption that we have here, but they only <laughs> work with really small objects. That's great. Yeah, that, that's great if you can send us that. All right, great. Um, and then, yes, so Carolyn, I'll follow up with you um, via email as well. And I think we have covered all of the questions. This has been a lot of engagement. So thanks everyone that stuck um, with it to the end here um, and thanks for watching Digitization 201. Um, check out our other episodes on the CCAHA YouTube page. Um, thanks everyone. Thanks.